Welcome to our part two of business ethics. First off, I'm really sad to be presenting this on um, a, a, a virtual medium because it's my favorite lecture to give in a classroom because we can just have so much interaction and discussion about the topic. So in lieu of actually being able to um, hear all your feedback and your thoughts on things, um, I'd like you to, as a voluntary exercise, go and have a, a research um, on what companies have done in response to COVID um, and, and what additional measures and expenses have they implemented in order to assist the country in this national pandemic. Um, the easiest example, I think, to, to find is of Vodacom um, and MTN and how much free data they've made available to students and, and to communities generally, um, to rapid responses, to, to the COVID um, teams. Um, and have a look and see whether after you've gone through this business ethics model, you can put your hand on your heart and, and say whether corporate South Africa has stepped up to the challenge that we find in our, in our country at, for the, at, at the moment. So that's my, my little challenge to you. And if you want to drop me a note on your findings or how you felt, then that, that would be great. So let's kick off with business ethics part two. In this module, we focus on corporate social responsibility as um, a business imperative of delivering that business ethics component as you go through your courses um, until you get up to the board exams, ethics become more and more relevant and um, are dealt with in more and more detail. But for this component, um, we're going to talk about corporate social responsibility and the benefits that having a structured corporate social responsibility program bring to companies. We're also going to go through some examples of um, community issues that have impacted corporate South Africa and how those have been addressed and some legislation that deals with some of the inequality that we have inherent in our country. So let's start with corporate social responsibility. This is defined or explained as achieving commercial success in a way that honors ethical values and respects people, communities, and the natural environment. It incorporates the triple context, which you may recall from previous lectures, relates to people, planet, and profit and includes the, in, in, in our current learnings, King Ford's reference to the six capitals being the resources on which companies rely in order to conduct their business, financial, manufactured, intellectual, human, social and community, and natural. So those are the buckets, if you will, um, of resources that a company requires in order to operate. So our corporate social responsibility happens in the context of all of those buckets. It's not purely um, some charitable expenditure. It is actually um, a significant impact on profits, um, on the broader sustainability of the company as a whole. We do find that it has interchangeable terms. So you might see reference to corporate citizenship which is uh, referred to in, the, in, in King 4 as well, but also in the requirements for the Social and Ethics Committee to, to ensure that the, co the company is seen to be a good corporate citizen. Corporate accountability, uh, which is very important. So when a company does something, it's held accountable for its action. Sustainability remains that ongoing focus of all stakeholders and, and not purely limited to human or environmental aspects as we might have considered 10 to 15 years ago. And corporate social investment, which is, which is more than simply charitable spend or donations or painting a wall at a nursery store. 
over the years, it's become formalized through various business practices. It's usually included in a set of policies um, and programs that are integrated into business operations and its supply chains and its decision making. CS CSR needs to be relevant to the strategy of the company. And if you go and have a look at some of the CSR programs that are implemented by bigger companies, those uh, will speak specifically to strategy. So in the mining community, you will see um, substantial investment into securing skills development um, in, in the um, geological and met metallurgical departments um, so that they can secure that ongoing skill set, that human capital and intellectual capital that's required for the company's ongoing sustainability. It also has to take consideration of the stakeholders that are involved in the company. So what are their interests? How big are they? What industry are they in? What geographic region are they in? There are a lot of articles um, in, in available online around Kumba's resettlement of the Dingleton community. Go and have a look at what Kumba says it's done and then have a look at some of the criticisms around how that project has been managed. But typically CSR will relate to issues around business ethics as a whole, community investment, environment, governance, human rights, the marketplace and the workplace. Key matters of interest to stakeholders around corporate social responsibility leads us to that consideration that it's broader than simply the company as a whole. Investors have a responsibility on them to invest in companies which have good corporate social responsibility programs or accountability. You'll find this in CRESA, in the Code for Responsible Investing in South Africa, which calls on large investor companies to invest responsibly and take responsibility for their investment choices. So if your pension fund money lands up in a company which invested in a product or in its supply chain was found to have um, promoted child labor, you would be tremendously disappointed that your pension money had, had promoted that unethical business practice. The JSE SRI index, um, which we spoke about in the last lecture, um, the, the social responsibility index, indicates companies which are considered to be responsible social investors. And there are the companies into which more um, institutional investors are going to look to investing their funds because they will have that accountability. And on the topic of accountability, that's the requirement that these companies are, are held responsible by their stakeholders, their stakeholders including their investors and institutional investors themselves are also held responsible by their own stakeholder base. Companies working with community organizations, reinvesting in education and empowerment of communities in which they operate, um, addressing skill shortages. I mentioned gold fields. Well, I mentioned the investment from the mining companies into, into um, studies that are relevant, but gold fields in particular um, has sponsored the whole metallurgy department at WITS. So the next time you're walking through the campus, go into the mining um, department. Um, it's, it's quite noticeable. It has that big dome on the top and the enormous statue of the worker outside. And just walk through that building and, and walk across to the ge geology department and think about the involvement of all of those stakeholders in mining activities in South Africa and what responsibility a mining company in South Africa might have to all of those stakeholders. There are lots of tangible benefits that companies seek to achieve through, through these community organizations and we'll talk about those in some detail in, in, in some of the following slides. But um, just to touch on a few, 
improving community nutrition and and the health of the the workforce from which a company takes its employees can have a direct impact on in, on decreasing sick leave that's taken among staff members um, and particularly in in more rural communities the promotion of vegetable gardens and sustainable farming practices is one area where companies tend to invest quite a bit um, Vodacom have a women farmers um, management program that specifically focuses on, on empowering women in the farming community. Our top farmer in South Africa is a black lady under the age of 30, which I think is quite remarkable. And then the supply chain. So I alluded to using um, un unethical business practices and, and child labor. And if you consider how big a supply chain can be for a particular product or a company, it might be difficult for some companies to actually identify all of the ethical practices that happen in that supply chain. So in gold mining, or any mining practice, it's relatively simple because the mining company itself is, is responsible from beginning to the end of their product. They, they dig the hole in the ground, they send their people down into the ground to extricate the gold, they bring the gold back up, and they even have a role in terms of how that gold dust is then refined and produced. So they have oversight over their whole supply chain. Whereas clothing manufacturers, particularly companies which import uh, from, from foreign companies, as is common to import from China, it becomes more difficult to understand that supply chain. So Mr. Price, as an example, imports a great deal of cheap clothing from China. And one has to wonder where they have how much they understand about that supply chain and where that those clothes are coming from how they are made who's making those clothes really and truly in the background and i think we all know the history of the 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 nike supply chain debacle where it was discovered that children in thailand were being tied to chairs in order to make those tackies and nike had a substantial reputational damage as a, as a consequence of that. So think about how broad a different company's supply chains might be and how big that responsibility could be for, for accountability down the line. Essentially, corporate social responsibility is a global issue. So what happens in one company, country will affect other countries. And if you consider how many Zimbabwean citizens um, are coming into South Africa simply to, to look for economic um, opportunities, which is completely understandable and defendable. Um, but the economy in, in Zimbabwe has impacted directly on the South African social environment. And to give a, 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 another good example of how broad this can be, the Obama administration invested a substantial amount of money in Ebola research and health clinics in areas affected by Ebola. And the reason for this was because America is the biggest funder of the World Health Organization. So when there's an Ebola outbreak, the World Health Organization has to respond and spend massive amounts of money, um, which literally comes from the U.S. coffers. So the admin Obama administration's approach was to actually invest in reducing the Ebola impact so that that would ultimately reduce the need for contributions to the World Health Organization and it saved a substantial amount of money for the U.S. taxpayer. Um, and you can compare that with the very different approach that um, the Trump administration has taken to COVID. Let's have a look at some of the um, more important or benefits of demonstrable CSR in businesses. So improved financial performance, avoiding paying, paying fines and avoiding losses from reputational issues has a bottom line effect. Customers are often drawn to brands with good reputations and 
that promoted brand image coming from CSR can also then have a positive impact on the financial performance of the, com of the company. We tend to be quite loyal uh, to companies that we know have produced goods in an ethical manner. So socially responsible um, trade and, and under the fair trade principle. There are even businesses who base their entire market campaign, their entire product offering is based on the fair trade principle. Um, if you've ever seen Bean Their Coffee, that's one of the better examples of, of a company which only generates product that is produced in a sustainable manner. And they have a good understanding of their, of their supply chain. CSR can also reduce operating costs. When one has to stand back and look at reducing your emissions of uh, carbon from the gases produced through your production process, in doing so, you also reduce your own operating costs. So as you lower your operating costs, so you actually uh, contribute to global climate change. So there's a, a twofer benefit in doing that. Improving your own working conditions for your employees being a major stakeholder and in lessen and lessening environmental impact um, on employees and in including employees in decision making often leads to more accountability, increased productivity and a reduced error rate. So um, if you've ever had your boss say to you, what do you think will work in solving a problem? And, and you've been allowed to give your input, it's often been a far more viable solution than if you were simply dictated to um, with a solution that, that you didn't believe in. Happy employees stay in their jobs and um, the companies are able to attract uh, more employees, more skilled employees and become competitive employers as a result of having good employee programs um, that results in a reduction of having to train new staff as they come in and that impact that it would have on decreased productivity whilst while staff members were being trained. And then access to capital. It's very interesting to note that more and more institutional investors, those big, big investors of pension funds and property and insurance money, are no longer keen to invest in companies that don't have climate change policies. So what would this mean for big companies like Sasol and Eskom, where their climate change policy is so integral to their entire production process, and Eskom has recently been found to have been non-compliant with a substantial number of its own internal policies and with regulation in terms of environmental carbon output. So that lowering of, of, of interest in investing in companies like this will have a significant impact on those companies' ability to tra attract capital. Given the recent challenges that Sassel has had with regards to COVID and the drop in the oil price, um, which was, has had a substantial impact on its share price, which was already under pressure from bad business decisions, the loss of investor capital could have an even more significant impact on its sustainability. So those climate change policies actually become something you can take to the bank. Let's have a look at specific issues, specific CSR issues that corporate South Africa have got involved in. And probably the most significant one in recent history has been the HIV and AIDS pandemic, with a growing number of people still becoming affected um, and still remaining a very prevalent condition, particularly in South Africa. The World Bank um, estimates that the economic impact of HIV and AIDS may reduce the growth of a national income by up to one third. So that's literally one third of your GDP going down the drain as a result of one 
one disease only and that's before you even bring in other issues such as economic challenges um, there's some statistics on the map attached from the UN AIDS around South Africa HIV prevalence currently 2018 so relatively um, new information and you'll see there's a substantial um, number of of people in, in, in South, South Africa who are still living with HIV. 20% 20, 20 adult prevalence is, is really a significant number. And if you look at the ages, that is pretty much your entire workforce age. Um, there's a, a, another statistic that was a little bit lower for 2017, um, but I think the, the UN AIDS is, is possibly... Um, more reliable and up to date and we will have a look at how this infection rate worldwide particularly of women and children has had a um, major contribution to the workforce so it goes without saying that it's become critical that businesses with operations of suppliers in countries that are impacted by HIV and AIDS develop more proactive ways of addressing the impact of this disease on their workforce and on their operations, given that it has a substantial impact on the financial and human capital through the loss of skilled employees and that increased uh, training costs for new employees and that decreased production time while upskilling takes place. So companies have responded to HIV and AIDS in various ways through developing clear workplace policies and programs, undertaking extensive prevention and education efforts within their own operations, conducting prevalence studies and surveys to ensure that they understand the long-term benefits of the investments that they're making, given that those investments into medical assistance can be substantially, um, a substantial amounts of money. Um, providing antiretroviral treatment to employees and developing partnerships and collaborations with government, with other corporates, with NGOs, with medical institutions in order to enhance that ability to fight the pandemic. There's also been a great deal of um, effort in focusing on quantitative costs and qualitative costs and how to reduce those. So quantitative costs will be the actual money that is lost through HIV and AIDS, so health costs, absenteeism and recruitment, and qualitative costs such as employee morale and reputational damage. Um, try and see if you can find uh, some articles from the mid-2000s around reputational damage companies suffered from not addressing HIV and AIDS in their companies. One has to ask though that in the last 20 years, in, in more modern times, has HIV fallen off the radar for companies and communities and government? And is it still as topical as it was 15 years ago possibly? The importance of addressing these challenges for business is quite significant. Having looked at that quantitative and qualitative data, it has a direct impact on the bottom line of the company and its ability to remain sustainable, particularly the impact it has on its financial and human capitals. So market growth, the long-term negative economic effects of the pandemic means that business opportunities may be limited. Increased productivity through good programs and that reduction in that HIV relate, uh, uh, rate um, means that, that that workforce remains sustainable. There's also decreased costs from health care and employee benefits. Companies are no longer having to put um, so much into, into their medical assistance programs. There's reduced employer liability um, for, for the outcomes of not having addressed these programs. And diversity has at least been given a little bit of a step up in terms of um, being promoted through greater health initiatives and that lower rate of employee turnover 
and the impact that it has on employee morale. I think it must be devastating to, to lose colleagues that you've worked with for many years in large numbers. Essentially, having a, pro a positive approach towards HIV has ensured sustainability of the business, and that's been the primary aim. Let's have another, uh, a look at another example of a CSR issue, one that has come to light more recently, and that's sexual harassment in the workplace. Sexual harassment happens so easily and, and almost innocuously without notice, and sometimes it can be um, really quite significant um, and have a very negative impact on people's psyche and their ability to work, and it can really promote a fear culture. So what is a, a particular challenge in a corporate with sexual harassment is it's not so tangible or visible as possibly HIV would be, where you literally are able to see the number of employees who are, who are taking sick leave and the number of employees who pass away or their family members pass away as a result of HIV. Sexual harassment is, is underlying and um, often just doesn't get the attention and the notice that um, it requires. It is a contravention of an individual's human rights and it can take place in, in many different ways. It can be implied, it can actually be stated, it can be demonstrably physical, it can be deliberate, it can be unintentional but through um, a lack of informed knowledge about how people may view certain behavior. It can be unsolicited um, and, and unwelcome. And there may, it, it's very rare that it happens in one isolated incident. It tends to happen in uh, more than one incident, either for the perpetrator or the victim. And it can include simply remarks with a sexual overtone, insinuations about a person's sexual activities or orientation, suggestive comments about somebody's appearance, unwanted physical contact, which can be very subtle from patting or simply a, um, a hand gesture when you're having a photograph taken with your boss and somehow his hand placement doesn't feel quite as comfortable as you would like, um, right through to really violent acts and rape and, and um, very ugly physical attacks. It can be simply inde indecent gestures, um, exposure, um, subtle uh, or, or deliberate proposals, pressure to engage in certain social activities. There can be, it can be done through um, various communications, so it doesn't necessarily need to be verbalized. You can receive emails or phone calls or um, memes on WhatsApp groups or a particular problem, um, unsolicited photographs, Generally, there is a power element to it. There seems to be a trend in that regard. So managers or superiors feel that they can subject their subordinates to the sort of harassment as a condition of employment and then hold it against them if they either don't acquiesce to that harassment or they, or they uh, become whistleblowers. And this creates a hostile environment for all employees that are impacted by it. It interferes with um, other employees and their ability to, to, to perform their work. It resu results in, beg your pardon, in intimidation and unpleasant working conditions. And it's important that every company deal with this. And they identify the fact that it can happen anywhere. So many companies have the approach that, oh, no, we're nice people. That's not something we would do. But you, it happens everywhere. And um, it is very prevalent. And it's incumbent upon all companies to deal with that through a formal process and policy.
So I've attached an extract in the next two slides from an article published in 2018 on sexual harassment in the South African workplace. Um, I've just highlighted some of the top findings, which um, are quite substantial and, and frightening. 30% of women and 18% of men having reported that they have been victims of sexual harassment. Um, with large portions of indications around how that's taken place um, and whether it's been from superiors. And interestingly, men um, finding unwanted attention from their subordinates. We don't tend to think that the boss can get harassed. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to deal with when you don't know how and to what degree it is happening, which highlights the importance of companies firstly recognizing that it can happen in their company and then secondly putting in place in um, policies and programs to identify where it happens to protect whistleblowers who are affected by it, to monitor the number and instances in which it takes place and then to deal with it through proactive reactions um, and, and responses and, and putting in, in place in the, um, policies or, or, sorry, a bigger part in procedures that make sure that it doesn't continue to happen. Um, so a, a, a horrific amount of people do not come forward about their abuse. And this was um, highlighted through the Me Too um, campaign where women were provided with more of a platform or encouraged or really the highlight around the fact that women don't tend to come forward about this. And men, even more significantly, our, our male predominant culture tends to not applaud that sort of behavior and in fact to applaud the opposite. Um, if you are the target of sexual harassment as a man, um, I'd imagine that that that's almost in our patriarchal society deemed to be quite a good thing or you're, on, you're lucky on the receiving end. And that isn't the case for a large number of, of, of people dealing with this reality. So looking at how um, companies could enforce their policies, a large number, 51% of companies don't even have clear sexual harassment policies in place. Um, only 37% have a process to report sexual harassment. So if you can't report it, you as a company can't possibly know how, how prevalent it is in your company. And then very few actually have um, confidential or anonymous reporting mechanisms um, and training programs. Is there room for improvement in, this, in, in, in our corporate environment in South Africa? I think there definitely is. What if companies took a proactive approach to sexual harassment as they had taken to HIV? Sexual harassment may not necessarily be so obviously hitting their financial and human capital resources, but it could well be having an impact and they're not identifying it. So what, what could companies do to improve their approach to limiting sexual harassment? That's the question that I throw out to you and I ask you to, to do some independent research and thinking on that. Think about what you, you would like your company to put in place and how you would like your, your employers to treat you if you were in this circumstance. Legislation in South Africa has made efforts to deal with some of our corporate social issues that we have in our country that are of historical in nature. And the Employment Equity Act is probably the most significant that comes out of the, after the constitutional dispensation. And this piece of legislation is aimed at promoting and facilitating equal opportunities in the employment place through the elimination of unfair or discriminatory practices relating to a wide range of issues. Race is obviously the one that's prevalent on our mind, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, pregnancy, color, marital status, family responsibility, age, 
disability, religion, your HIV status, um, your religious belief, your political opinions, the culture in which you have, have grown up, language. These are all areas where discrimination and unfair practices can find a trend or find even very implied, subtle um, impact on, on our community. So their promotion has been around effective managing of equality and diversity in the workplace um, on an, uh, and holding employers accountable for, for ensuring that those practices of um, unfair discrimination don't take place. The, it includes quite a lot of regulation around um, equality and equity in the workplace. Um, with the aim of promoting equal opportunity and fair treatment through this minimization of, of discrimination and then through implementing measures to actually address disadvantages that, that are historic, such as the affirmative action processes. It has a very broad definition of its designated groups being people who are impacted by unfair or discriminatory practices. Um, and, and it includes women of all race, which is different from the BEE legislation, which excludes any white people, including women. Um, it also includes obviously black people and people with disabilities. It defines a designated employer, which is, is essentially any employer of, of people. Um, and it, it really enforces these regulations quite stringently. And every two years or so, um, a, a representative from, from the Department of Labor will come round to offices, big and large, and um, harass <laughs> the uh, poor HR officer into reviewing all of those policies um, and making sure that they do align with, with the Act. Um, there's also um, an Employment Equity Committee that companies with more than 50 employees need to have and um, make sure that those things are, are being addressed and those committee members need to include employees, which is quite um, proactive and it needs to include employees across those defined groups, so um, women, all representation from races and, and people with disabilities. It also includes um, various manners of um, redress for employees who, who would like to take, the, take their employers directly to the regulator. Let's have a look at broad based black economic empowerment, which um, was formalized as a um, company, a country's um, prerogative, really, in the early 2000s. The first BE legislation came out in 2003. The idea of being to transform the, the business sector that was traditionally in the hands of white owners and white management so that it had a broader base of economic empowerment. So attached to the Act are the codes of good practice that I think we are all very familiar with, and they are voluntary. What's quite interesting about them being voluntary, um, and, and it's sort of a bit reminiscent of King, is that legislation has taken the view here that you can't legislate moral behavior. But through various mechanisms in those codes of good practice, particularly procurement, it, it has a self-promoting imperative. So companies get better points for themselves when they procure from empowered companies. So companies are therefore limiting their procurement to only dealing with empowered companies. And in a way, it becomes self um, uh, promoting and um, uh, companies hold other companies to account for for their empowerment, which is um, 
been quite an effective way of um, integrating a voluntary code into business practice. The first code um, defined key dimensions for transformation that needed to be addressed. Firstly, ownership equality, um, based on a percentage of shares which must have an economic uh, benefit and value attached to them. So you can't simply just give away free shares that have no voting rights attached to them and no rights to dividends. Control being um, around the votes that directors as shareholders and as executives on the board can have. So votes in terms of being um, at, at a board level and then further down in terms of how subsidiary companies have, have been put together. Skills development. So there are a substantial number of benefits in upskilling your black employees. And there are more benefits to be had if you upskill uh, female employees and dis disabled employees. So there's bonus points for doing that. And that's obviously on a proportionality scale of, of the fact that they want to promote um, women empowerment as well as black women as well as black empowerment, um, women are a specific category in that, and then disabled black people in terms of the definitions of the legislation. Then through enterprise and supplier development, meaning that there is literally investment into other companies. So companies have to make investment into their supply chain, and then in terms of enterprise development, almost set up an entirely new company, um, establish and assist another company in coming into being and, and becoming successful. And that can be a company that works in, in your industry or it can be something completely different. Uh, Macquarie Bank, which came from Australia um, in the early 2000s, set up a um, chauffeur business with the through their driver, um, and they put up, put the business together, they invested money in it, they bought vehicles for him, they assisted him in training his staff, and essentially he, he didn't, he was no longer an employee of the company, but then they used him for all of their deliveries and for all of their client um, transportation, and that company is tremendously successful um, as corporate as, as a corporate chauffeur these days, and um, that that's now almost twenty years old. A very successful business that started out as an enterprise development business, and that is the real intention of enterprise development. This chauffeur who started off as a driver at Macquarie now employs sort of thirty drivers and has a fleet of vehicles. Then there's social economic development, which we used to refer to as our CSIR, corporate social investment, which is more of a charitable spend. It's a lower percentage of your net profits after tax that you need to invest, but it's still quite a significant amount of money. And this is literally giving cash um, or a benefit, um, a monetary that has a monetary value um, to a community project. It can be in any area. Um, some of the sector codes, which we'll look at now, have limited it, but essentially it's it's deliverable to any person um, or any um, organization that is um, benefiting black recipients and um, has a broader social impact. Let's have a look at the application of the BE code. Uh, so it divides it up into three elements. Large enterprises are defined as being companies with annual turnovers of over 50 million rand. And they have to apply either the generic scorecard or their sector specific scorecard. So we'll have a look at that in a minute. Then there's qualifying small enterprises, QSEs, which have a turnover between 10 million rand and 50 million rand. Um, they have to apply the QSE scorecard. Uh, 
uh, which is a little bit less onerous than the generic scorecard. Um, they get to apply either skills development or enterprise development. Um, so they, they don't have quite a, such a burden on them. And then there's EMEs or exempt micro enterprises. These are small organizations that are under 10 million annual turnover. And regardless of their ownership, black or white, they are automatically level four. The idea being that we are trying to promote our SME business. You'll remember from other discussions that we've had how prevalent and important that SME sector is to the South African economy. What the new codes, the 2013 codes, also introduced were priority elements. And this is a minimum requirement for companies to achieve um, in order to get the points for that particular element. So on ownership, one has to get a certain percentage, say 10% or 20%, depending on the sector. And um, if you don't achieve that, you automatically drop a level. So you could have complied with all the other components, but if you don't meet the minimum on, on these priority elements, then you will drop a level as a punishment measure anyway. So stepping up the responsibility to some extent. So um, priority elements are typically ownership, skills development, and then enterprise and supplier development. Then aside from the generic scorecard, which applies to all those large enterprises, certain sectors of um, industries have developed their own sector charters. The idea being that in these particular sectors, they invest their money specifically to promote the growth of that sector. Uh, mining, finance, transport, ICT and construction have these sector codes. And they typically apply a higher standard than the generic codes would. Um, they also have limitations in the extent of where certain skills or enterprise and supplier development and social economic development spend is done. So those things can only be done in the ICT space. So to give you an example, in the ICT sector, those companies can only donate to um, under their charitable spend to um, promoting ICT. So they can give away laptops, but they can't give away food, which has had a major impact on some of the um, social economic programs that companies already had in place. Vodacom had schools that it would sponsor, but it can now only claim the expenditure on the computer and ICT spend that it puts into those schools. It can't claim the expenditure around the food or the building or the health services or the uniforms or the transport that it provides for the children to attend those schools. So there have been some negative consequences of these sector charters. Let's have a look at what the generic codes deal with. So um, along the top horizontal line, the various pillars against which uh, companies have to achieve ownership, management and control, skills development, preferential procurement, enterprise development, supplier development and social and economic contributions. And the points for each are set out in the next line below, as well as the targeted um, expenditure or percentage that a company has to achieve. And some of those are quite large. So if we look at supplier development, that is 2% of net profit after tax. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but then when you add it together with the 1% required for social and economic spend, and the 1% required for um, enterprise development spend, and the 6% required for training black employees, which is quite difficult to spend that amount of money. Um, you could probably put every single black employee through an MBA and you still won't hit that 6%. Um, that can be quite an expensive exercise for companies. To give you an, an example, a company with 
an annual turnover of around 250 million rand a year, would have to spend about 5 million rand simply to achieve those um, components of the, of the charter, uh, not, not then including the ownership which would need to be, um, would need to be achieved. Um, ownership is targets 50% black ownership and 50% black representation and then there are various sub minimums. Um, there are minimum thresholds which we have set out in the next line below and then an indication of once you, you've calculated your score what level you might be on. So in order to be a level one you actually need to get over a hundred points and you need to have a 135% procurement recognition level, which means that um, you have to have procured from predominantly um, empowered companies. And then other companies that procure from you can claim up to 135% of their spend um, from in terms of points um, from what they've spent with you so that's that self-promoting that self-compliance mechanism that's built into these voluntary codes let's look at, at how that generic scorecard differs from the ICT sector scorecard so we'll be able to see immediately that the points are much bigger and that the uh, targeted expenditure is bigger. The targeted ownership is somewhat lower, um, but remember that it does have the minimum, sub-minimum, so one would be have to go down a level simply for not achieving any of those um, ownership um, and, and skills development and procurement spend. So um, this becomes quite sub significant in terms of enterprise development, which has gone from 1% now to 3%, and supplier development is still at 2%, and social and economic contributions are up to 1.5%, remembering that you can only invest or, or make your ICT, your economic and contributions uh, into ICT areas and then the uh, scores you have to get over 120 points now to achieve a level one rather than simply 100 points so it's a it's a lot more onerous for companies to to meet and it has unfortunately had the effect that since coming into into effect far less companies have been BE compliant. Companies that were BE compliant before are now automatically no longer compliant as a result of some of the sector charters. So it has had um, some negative consequences, even though the intention was good. So that summarizes our discussion on business ethics, particularly focusing on corporate social responsibility. I'm sure you can um, understand why it's so important to discuss these things, think about these things on an ongoing basis, how they connect with the sustainability of the company, and on an ongoing basis, continue to research how companies deal with business ethics as a whole. I hope you enjoyed that lecture, and I will chat to you again next week.